What does an eye exam look like? My name is Carla Cox, Registered Dietitian and Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist and your host for today's program. Remember that our Ask the Expert series is all about answering questions from our listeners, so start getting your questions ready. For those of you on the phone, press star three, that's star three on your keypad and an operator will collect your question and place you in the queue so you can have the opportunity to ask your question. To participate online, type in your name and question in the fields below the streaming player. Press the submit question button and your question will come directly to us. We invite you to provide us with your feedback and our five question survey at the end of this event. Okay, now a little bit about why we're here today. The American Diabetes Association, together with Visionary Partners, VSP Vision Care, and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, is focusing on an often overlooked but costly and devastating complication of diabetes, vision loss. This eye health initiative, Focus on Diabetes, provides tools and resources for people with diabetes to learn how to reduce their risk of developing eye disease by managing glucose values and getting an annual comprehensive dilated eye examination, even if symptoms are not present. As part of the initiative, the ADA is holding this free educational Q&A. We'll cover information and tips to help you take charge of your health. The health and safety of all those we serve at the American Diabetes Association is our top priority. In general, people with diabetes face greater risks of complications when dealing with viral infections, and that is true of COVID-19. The ADA encourages people with diabetes to get vaccinated, and if you have questions about the vaccination, please talk to your healthcare provider. ADA also encourages you to follow the guidance of the CDC. For more information, and our most updated information, please visit our website at diabetes.org forward slash coronavirus or call 1-800-342-2383. And now I am delighted to introduce our guest for today's event. Dr. Jeffrey Gerson graduated from Indiana University School of Optometry in 1997 and completed his residency concentrating on low vision and ocular disease. He sees primary care patients and has an emphasis on retinal care in his practice in Olath, Kansas. I also wanna add he's been an, on our program before and is a wonderful expert and I am delighted to welcome him back. Dr. Gershon, do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, not really, just excited to uh, take some questions. Great. As we're waiting for our callers and online listeners to chime in, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off with asking you if you could give us a brief introduction to what does an eye, gen eye exam generally look like for folks that are a bit concerned about having one? Yeah, so, you know, the first thing that I would say is that there's certainly nothing to be worried about or have any anxiety in regards to eye exams. Eye exams, for the most part, should be a, a fairly simple, straightforward process. Um, you know, one of the reasons I went into optometry is I wanted to do something where people wouldn't dislike coming to see me. And I always, when I was younger, always, I never disliked going to see my eye doctor, always had good experiences. And so hopefully that's what people experience. <clears throat> what I would tell you to expect is to, to budget probably about an hour's worth of time. And it may not take that long but I would be prepared for it to take that long. And most likely you'll have your eyes dilated. Many of you have maybe had that done. That's when drops are used to dilate your pupil. So make your pupils much bigger. And the reason why that's important is when we look through your pupils, that's how we look inside your eyes. And having a dilated pupil is like looking through a giant big window instead of just having a little peephole to look through. And the reason I point that out is because if you've had your eyes dilated before, you know that after it's done, you're oftentimes a little bit light sensitive or maybe a little blurry up close for a couple hours. So, you know, I, I would say in summary, budget about an hour's worth of time. Don't be surprised if you have some drops used that make your vision a little bit blurry or a little light sensitive, but overall, pretty easy experience. Great, thank you. And I think always taking dark glasses with you when you go to make sure that you can actually get home or have someone to drive you home immediately afterwards. Yeah, although what I thank would tell you, you is we always, yes. we always have, in case someone doesn't have that, we have that at the office. And pretty much any eye doctor's office will have that 
is to have some some kind of temporary sunglasses that you can use because if you go outside and it's a sunny day or in my case as i look out the window today is snowy day then it makes it really bright and so it's important as you mentioned carla to have something dark uh to help you be able to you know be able to see outside whether you're driving or if you're the passenger yeah great thank you all right now let's take the first question um it comes from um von lee from idaho um I, uh, von lee you are on the call hello 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 um i wanted to ask you a question with my diabetes, I have developed neuropathy, and I pretty much have it all over. And I was wondering if it's safe to get cataract surgery. Yeah, so good question. So one of the things that oftentimes uh, people with diabetes will encounter is neuropathy, where you have tingling or numbness, whether it's in your fingers or your toes. And actually, sometimes you can develop neuropathy in your eyes. So I want to touch on that first before I get to your question. Um, and the reason I wanted to touch on uh, neuropathy in the eyes is sometimes people with diabetes, they don't have as much sensitivity. And so sometimes your eyes could be very dry and not feel dry um, or have scratches and you not feel it, which is yet another reason for the importance of routine eye care, because there could be something that's maybe subtle or not so subtle that's going on that you may not know about it, that you may not feel because of neuropathy. Now to your question about cataract surgery, cataract surgery is one of, if not the most commonly performed outpatient surgeries done in this country. And if you have neuropathy, that does not interfere with having cataract surgery. So just because you have neuropathy elsewhere in your body or even in your eyes, um, that would not mean that you couldn't have cataract surgery. So that's that's good news because most people once they have cataract surgery, really realize a huge benefit in uh, their ability to be able to see. So good news for you, no reason to worry about the neuropathy in regards to cataract surgery. Great, thank you. We have a good question coming in from uh, Gloria that we hear a lot. Gloria, you are on the phone. Oh yes, good afternoon. I would like to know how often, how many times during the year do we need to come in for an eye exam and also to have our eyes dilated? And then one more other thing I didn't tell them, um, stigmatism. What's, what is stigmatism? So that's all I have today. Have a blessed day. Thank you, Gloria. No, those, those are two really great questions. Um, so the first one about frequency of eye exam. And I would tell you first and foremost, the most important thing that I could tell any of you in regards to eye exams is don't wait till you have a problem to get your eyes checked. Because anybody, whether you have diabetes or not, can have eye problems, sometimes fairly dramatic, and have no symptoms. It's even more important with diabetes to have your eyes examined early and often. So in general, if you have diabetes, you should have your eyes examined when you're first diagnosed with diabetes, and then at least once a year. Now, depending on potential changes in your eyes, it may be important to have your eyes checked more frequently than that, but at the very least once a year, and that will most nearly always include having your eyes dilated. Um, and then stigmatism. So that's a, that's a good question that I hear um, all the time. And the reason people ask about astigmatism is they think it's something bad. It's something that they worry about. And almost everybody, so when I have a patient ask me and they say, well, Dr. Gerson, can you tell me about my stigmatism? My response is this. Have you heard of nearsighted? Most people say yes. Have you heard of farsighted? Most people say yes. And I say, well, astigmatism is the third kind of prescription you can have. So whether you're nearsighted, farsighted, or have astigmatism, all that any of those mean is that you need glasses or contacts to correct your vision. So astigmatism is not an eye disease. It is um, totally independent of or not related to diabetes and something that basically you get glasses or contacts and or have cataract surgery and it takes care of it. 
So it's certainly nothing to have any concerns uh, in regards to it. But, but Gloria, it's a good question because I hear that literally every single day. So I'm glad that you asked that. Great. If you're just joining us, welcome to today's Ask the Experts. What does an eye exam look like? As a reminder, for those of you on the phone, press star three, that's star three on your keypad and an operator will collect your question and place you in the queue so that you may have the opportunity to ask your question live. To participate online, once again, type in your name and question the fields below the streaming player, press the submit question button, and your question will come directly to us. And so an online question. What causes eye floaters? Why do some get them and some not? Yeah, the, the, you know, Carla, these are great questions because these are literally things that I that come up pretty much every day in the office. So what are eye floaters? So for anyone that's not familiar with it, when someone asks about eye floaters, basically it means that they're just kind of looking off into space and they see little things just kind of floating in their vision. And oftentimes it looks like there's a gnat or a fly or something just kind of floating around that you know isn't there. So the easiest way that I can explain this is our eyes are filled with a gel. And when we're younger, the gel has a certain consistency and is attached to the back of the eye. Well, as we have more birthdays, and I, I generally don't tell people that they're getting old or older, I just say more birthdays. So as we have more birthdays, the consistency of that gel changes and it pulls away from the back of the eye. So the technical name for this is what's called a vitreous detachment. Not to be confused with a retinal detachment. A retinal detachment requires fairly quick treatment and can really be a big deal. But a vitreous detachment, when that gel pulls away, is no big deal, but it creates floaters. Because now something that was attached to the back of the eye is floating right in front of it. And so as light comes into the eye, and it hits that surface that's no longer attached to the back, it creates a shadow. And that little shadow is what you perceive as a floater. Now, there's good news and bad news to when people get floaters. The bad news is the actual thing or gel that's floating around never actually goes away. It, that's there. The good news is for most people, once you start noticing a floater, usually within about a month or so, you don't notice it anymore. And that's because our brains are pretty smart. These floaters are annoying and our brain tells us, this is annoying, I don't wanna see it anymore, so let's just ignore it. And so for most people, after about a month, their brain learns to ignore it and they rarely see it. But you know, one cautionary tale that I would give is I, I did mention earlier the, I, the difference between the gel or vitreous and a retinal detachment. Anytime someone has new onset of floaters, or weird things flashing in their vision, it's important to get your eyes checked fairly quickly. I would tell you in the next day or two, because it could be the gel, the change in the gel, which is no big deal. It could be a retinal detachment, which is a really big deal. And in people with diabetes, it could be something else. It could actually be a blood vessel that broke where there's a little bit of hemorrhage or blood inside the eye that we would want to know about. So new onset, of floating spots or flashing spots, something important to get checked out by your eye care provider. That's great. And this coming from Luella uh, from Virginia is kind of following up uh, on that question. So Luella, you're on the line. Oh, good afternoon. Yes, I wanted to know, um, why I was seeing more floaters in my left eye. I already had uh, cataract service, uh, surgery there. And, um, and also I'm concerned about the film that I see on my eye in the morning. Um, I don't know, it looks, it, it looks like small snot. And I'm concerned. I'm, I'm gonna be going to the eye doctor soon in reference to my glasses, but I, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted some insight. Could you help me, please? Yeah, absolutely, Luella. So, um, you know, so one reason why you may notice floaters more after cataract surgery is now your vision is more clear. So, if someone has cataracts, that's like having a, a dirty window or a dirty lens inside a camera. And so, then once you have your cataract surgery and you have the implant put in, 
now all of a sudden everything is clearer and you may be seeing things that you hadn't before. So although it is possible that cataract surgery can create or make worse floaters, it sounds like what's more likely is that you may have had some floaters, but you notice them more now just because your vision is so much clearer. As far as the film in the morning, um, you know, oftentimes our eyes can get or feel a little bit dry overnight or when we wake up in the morning. And so sometimes there's very, and this is something you should ask your eye doctor about when you go in. But oftentimes the, what we'll have someone do about it is really quite simple, whether it be using artificial teardrops and that can help moisten or lubricate your eyes so it doesn't seem like there's a film over it. Or the other thing that can sometimes be helpful is you may have had an eye doctor tell you about using a hot compress. So this is basically using, it can be a hot washcloth or anything that you get hot and just kind of hold it over your eyes for 20, 30 seconds and gently kind of rub and clean up around your eyelids and eyelashes. We think about washing our hair, but we oftentimes don't think about our eyelashes. And it doesn't take soap or shampoo or anything like that, just some hot water and a little bit of rubbing. And, and oftentimes that can really help kind of clean things up and prevent those eye boogers that you were, or eye snots that you, that you were referring to. Great advice. Okay, we have a question coming in from Edmund. Edmund is from Roscoe, Illinois. Edmund, you're on the line. Oh, I have been just diagnosed with mac wet macular degeneration. I was just wondering what that entailed. Yeah, so, you know, unfortunately, macular degeneration is a very, very common condition, especially depending on age. It's certainly something that Again, as we have more birthdays, we're more prone to developing macular degeneration. The most common kind is what's called dry macular degeneration, where there's some degenerative changes in the macula. The macula is the very central part of the back of our eye. And so if you think of a bullseye, the macula is that very center circle. And the macula is what we use when we look at things with detail. So wet macular degeneration is when the we now have there's now abnormal blood vessels growing in that part of the eye in the macula so we have abnormal blood vessels that start to leak or bleed a little bit and oftentimes usually that causes some distortion or change to vision so the good news though is especially if caught early it certainly can be treated and interestingly the treatment for wet macular degeneration is essentially the same as it is for many of the changes that require treatment in diabetes. So if you have what's called diabetic macular edema, the treatment is essentially the same as it is for wet macular degeneration. So I'll tell you what the treatment is and, and just kind of bear with me for just a second. The treatment for either wet macular degeneration or macular edema or swelling from diabetes in the macula is actually getting injections in your eye, which for anyone that hasn't had that happen or has never heard about that, I know it sounds terrible. But what I will tell you and what I tell my patients every day is the worst part about the treatment is the anxiety that you're feeling right now as I tell you about the treatment. The actual treatment of having that done for most people is no big deal, that there's really no pain involved, very minimal discomfort. So that's generally the treatment, and it's rarely just treated once. It generally requires repeat treatments over time. Uh, there's some, some pretty exciting news uh, in the area of macular degeneration and diabetic macular edema, is that there was a new drug approved just within the last month where the interval between treatments for about half of the people, they could go 16 weeks, where historically the medications that were being used needed to be used almost once a month, which meant getting injections about monthly. So great strides in newer medications and that the frequency for treatments is going down fairly dramatically so with very successful treatment. That is great news. So we have a question coming in from Denise. Denise is from New York City. Denise, you're on the line. Hi, thank you for taking my call. 
Uh, I'm 73. Uh, both parents were diabetics. I'm pre-diabetic, and I also have glaucoma, but my um, I was diagnosed maybe 15 years ago with uh, glaucoma, but my pressure in the eye has stayed low for a number of years. I'm concerned with what happens if I have to have cataracts. I've been told I have something. It begins with a P, and I can't remember the, uh, let's call it a disease. The My eye is oval, and in order to put the lens in, they have to put a mesh oval in the eye to keep the eye from not collapsing, from uh, these, uh, I guess the wall from not collapsing. Will the diabetes give me any additional problems? Good question. So, you know, it's an interesting point that you make, Denise, that oftentimes people have more than one thing going on. Not everything is simple. Um, in general, what I'll tell you is that cataract surgery for most people is fairly straightforward, fairly simple with really good outcomes. And, you know, I should have mentioned earlier that people with diabetes tend to develop cataracts a little bit sooner than people that don't have diabetes, which you can either take that as good news or bad news. You could take it as bad news if you think that getting cataracts is, is a bad thing. You could take it as really good news if you look at cataracts as, as being an opportunity to have surgery and have implants put in that dramatically decrease your reliance on glasses. I actually had a patient this morning that was very upset when I told her that she didn't have cataracts. She was hoping she did because she was wanting to be able to have the surgery. Now, you also mentioned glaucoma. And as it turns out, cataract surgery nearly always helps with controlling glaucoma. Um, whether it's just be regular cataract surgery or something that's done additionally at the time of cataract surgery that for many people gets them off of their uh, pressure lowering drops. So again, it's another instance where needing cataract surgery could be really good news because it may be able to help you see better as well as lower your eye pressure and potentially decrease your dependence on eye drops. And again, all of this kind of independent from diabetes, meaning having diabetes or pre-diabetes shouldn't create any complications. Another thing I might add as the diabetes educator piece to this is that um, managing your glucose always, pre-surgery, post-surgery will also help in recovery for any kind of surgery or any kind of invasion into your body. So it's good to make sure that things are kind of lined up and that you're taking care of your diabetes as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point because any surgery is still surgery. And even though I make cataract yeah. surgery sound fairly simple, it's still surgery. And there's more than zero risk. It's not very high, but it's still more than none. And to your point, Carla, there still is a very small incision. Now in cataract surgery, the size of the incision is about one and a half millimeters. It's really, really small, does not require any sutures, and for most people, it heals very nicely, very quickly. But to your point, when it comes to eyes, when people ask me, well, gosh, what's the best thing I can do to help protect my eyes if I have diabetes? The answer is, is to your point, Carla, just doing the best you can in controlling your blood glucose and your blood pressure. Those are the best things you can do for your eyes. And coincidentally, or not so coincidentally, that's the best thing you can do for virtually any part of your body. That's right. Okay, we have a question coming in from Bill Hubbard from Salem, North Carolina. Good morning, good morning, good well, afternoon, I guess now, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you morning. hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We've got good. you. Uh, I've been, I've been uh, faithfully registered uh, ever since I've re been registered with diabetes 10 years ago, getting my eyes checked. And this year was the first time that the doctor said that he thought he saw a very small uh, cataract, but I shouldn't do anything, and it's too small to do anything. So I want to know if there's anything that you would recommend that I need to do to help myself, or is there anything that can be done 
if you catch cataracts early? Yeah, so it's a good question. So, you know, people oftentimes ask, when is it time to have cataract surgery? Because it used to be people would say, well, your cataracts have to get ripe or they have to get bad enough. And the reality is, is the time to have cataract surgery is when the cataracts are starting to interfere with your vision and maybe to where you're not seeing as well as you'd like or you're not doing some of the activities that you normally do because of it. Now, once you start to develop cataracts, there's nothing that we can really do <clears throat> to reverse the cataracts. Um, now, if it's related to diabetes, as Carla already mentioned, controlling your blood glucose as well as possible might be helpful. But the reality is, is that cataracts come with birthdays. And if you get old enough, you will develop some degree of cataract. That doesn't mean that everybody will require surgery, but it's, it's what I actually tell my patients in their 60s and 70s, if they ask about cataracts, and they were like you, Bill, where I'm telling them that, well, you've got a little bit of cataract. What I would follow that with would be, but it'd be really weird if you didn't. Somebody your age should have a little bit of cataract and we'll follow it over time to see when and if it requires anything done about it. Great, thank you. So could you comment on wearing dark glasses? When you wear sunglasses, is that helpful in preventing progression or preventing getting cataracts, reducing your risk? Yeah, so, you know, when asking about sunglasses and particularly what you block with sunglasses are ultraviolet light. And what I would generally tell someone about sunglasses is there's certainly no downside to wearing sunglasses. They certainly do not cause harm. But it's really pretty unlikely that wearing sunglasses <clears throat> will really make much of a difference in regards to cataracts or macular degeneration and certainly not in diabetic retinopathy. So I, I would probably tell you that you're, you're better off if you wear sunglasses, but if for some reason you don't like them or don't want to wear them, then I wouldn't worry too much about it. Oftentimes it's a preference just based on your comfort. Some people are more light sensitive and then it absolutely makes sense to wear, cataract, uh, to wear sunglasses. Great, thank you. Linda has written in, I had cataract surgery a few years ago and now have what my doctor calls a cloudy capsule, which has affected my vision. Can you explain what it is and is it easily corrected? Yeah, good question. So a cloudy capsule, let me kind of explain. And again, I'll just use the terms that I use when, when, I, when I'm seeing patients in the office. When you have cataract surgery, basically what the cataract surgeon's doing is they're going into your eye, and cataract means that the lens in your eye is cloudy. So what they do is they peel a little hole in the front of that lens, and they suck out the cloudy stuff that's inside it and put an implant in that gives you really good vision. Now, what they don't do at the time of surgery is anything to the backside of that. So they peel an opening in the front and create a window, but leave the back part of, it's like a bag around the lens. And what is very common after cataract surgery is the back surface of that bag, the capsule, becomes a little bit cloudy. And that's what your doctor is referring to when they say cloudy capsule. It's a super easy fix. It's an in-office laser procedure that takes just a couple minutes. So it's either in the office of an ophthalmologist or sometimes it's done at a surgery center, but it's really quick, really easy, and will immediately make a difference if you need that. It's not, the, it's not that your cataracts came back. <clears throat> Once a, you have cataract surgery, that part of your eye, that lens is gone and it cannot come back. It's a different layer that becomes a little bit cloudy. So it's something that when people have that procedure done, it's generally very satisfying because it, it, it's, it's easily done and makes a really big difference. Very nice, positive improvement. Great. So you mentioned at the start that persons who have type 2 diabetes should have an annual dilated ex eye exam on diagnosis. What about people with type 1 diabetes? Is it different or is it the same? Yeah, so it's similar. The, the difference is that the uh, agencies will tell you that when you're diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, 
that you should get your eyes examined within the first five years and then annually after that. And the reason that it's a little bit different, it sounds a little bit odd, is because once you're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, you've likely had it for several years, if not longer, by the time you're diagnosed. With type 1 diabetes, people generally get diagnosed right at onset because if not, it would lead to dire consequences. And so once someone has diabetes, it generally takes a few years in most cases before there's much, if any, risk for changes in the eye. So that's why if someone, if we always knew right when someone was diagnosed or when they first developed diabetes, that's different than when they're diagnosed, especially in type two diabetes. But after, so in type one, it's within five years of diagnosis and then annually thereafter. Now, what I would tell you though, is even though that's general recommendations, I would generally tell patients that whether it's type one or type two diabetes, I would recommend an eye exam at diagnosis and every year thereafter. Because to me, it's kind of hard to tell someone, hey, you've got diabetes, we should check your eyes sometime in the next few years. And then all of a sudden to say, well, great, you did great, now let's see you every year. I think it's important to get on track with annual dilated eye exams. And can you clarify the difference between an eye exam and a dilated? I mean, does anybody do a non-dilated eye exam? Yeah, so it's, it's fairly common for people to have eye exams where their eyes are not dilated. So for example, uh, if someone's young and healthy and maybe had their eyes dilated last year, Oftentimes it's not necessarily needed or warranted to dilate their eyes again. So dilation is, is more important um, for sure if you have diabetes. And as we have more birthdays or get older, dilated exams are more important to find conditions that are more common as we get older. If someone's young and healthy, the likelihood of having any problem that's uncovered by a dilated eye exam is fairly remote. So for the 16-year-old and the 20-year-old patients that I saw today that had a dilated eye exam last year, it wasn't really needed or warranted to do the dilation again this year. Now, had either of them had diabetes, that would have been a different story, but neither of them did. They were both young and very healthy. So Latonia is um writing in and asking what causes narrow angle glaucoma yeah so glaucoma is you know we think of glaucoma as being kind of a singular thing we, we just say glaucoma but as it turns out there are many types of glaucoma just like diabetes we just say diabetes even though there's type 1 there's type 2 there's gestational diabetes there's other subsets or subtypes of diabetes glaucoma is kind of the same thing there's different types of glaucoma so narrow angle glaucoma is more common in people that are farsighted and is more common in Asians. And so narrow angle glaucoma, what it is, is our eyes produce fluid and then the fluid drains out. And where the fluid drains out is between the cornea, the very front surface, and your iris, the colored part of your eye. So where those two meet, it's, it's kind of, it's at an angle like this. And in the, where they meet, now you see there's an opening there, that's a drain. If it's like this, that's narrow and it's harder for the fluid to get into the drain. And so narrow angle glaucoma is where that drain is much more narrow than normal and can sometimes impede the flow of that fluid out that can cause an increase in eye pressure. The, the one thing that I think is relevant to this is sometimes you'll hear on commercials or read on labels of medicines, maybe cough medicines, to, excuse me, not take it if you have glaucoma. And that virtually always applies only to people with narrow angle glaucoma. As it turns out, narrow angle glaucoma is fairly uncommon. Um, again, it's more common in people that are more farsighted or in Asians. Thank you. Uh, Bill has a great question. Bill is from Zion, Illinois, and I think everybody wants to ask this question. Go ahead, Bill. Oh, I'm sorry, I got 
Jean on instead. I'll get I'll get back to you, Bill. Jean is on. Jean, you can ask your question. Jean Miller. Yes, Jean Miller from Brentford, Pennsylvania. Okay, um, this is kind of a personal one. I was at someone's house and I was putting my boots on to leave, and she doesn't have anything, any chair or anything to lean on. And when I put my foot up to stick my foot in my boot, I keeled right over and I hit my head hard on her hardwood floors, hard enough that I, above the left eye, I had the imprint of her floor. And this is the first time in my 88 years that I've actually you know, really fallen. Well, I notice my left eye now is, it's blurry, and it bothers me a lot. I mean, I don't see out of it as good as I did. That was my good eye. And I have got an appointment uh, set up, and I'll be going this in March to see my doctor. But I wondered, could that have caused the difference in my sight when I hit that floor that hard? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a good question. I'm sorry about taking a fall like that. I'm sure that was scary. Um, yeah, so hitting your eye that hard could certainly uh, cause harm. And, all, you know, things like that happen, and oftentimes there's, there's no issue because of it. But what I would tell you is that if you have some sort of trauma, and you notice a change in vision, that warrants uh, getting your eyes checked and in short order. And so what I mean by that is, if someone were to call me today and say, hey, I hit my head and I'm not seeing as well, what should I do? I would probably say, well, I need to see in the office today or tomorrow. And I wouldn't want to make you wait really too much longer than that. Only because if, and it's a big if, if there's something going on like a detached retina or something like that that requires treatment, outcomes are always better when things are treated earlier rather than later. So, you know, the one thing that I might suggest is calling the doctor's office back and just seeing if they can get you in sooner just to make sure that there's, that there's nothing wrong. But to let them know that you had trauma, it affected your vision, and that you're worried about. So I, that, that, I think that's the main thing that, that I would tell you, that yes, hitting your head hard enough certainly can cause uh, issues to happen. And sometimes it may need to be treated in fairly short order. One of the other things that people worry about when they have trauma like that is if they break, if they break a bone, they break one of the bones around their eye, whether it's on the bottom, the top, or around the side. And it's not uncommon to have what's called an orbital fracture, so to break one of those bones. The good news is, is, is even if that happens, normally it will not require surgery. But again, the only way you'll know whether it will require surgery is to go in and have it checked out. Always a good idea. Okay, Bill, Bill from Zion, Illinois, your turn. Yeah, hello? Yes, oh, Bill. Okay, I just wanna make sure you could hear me. Well, I have another question about the dilation, but while I was waiting, Somebody, because I keep hearing it being out in the sun, and I'm out. So I'm retired. I sit outside. I walk a lot, and I don't like sunglasses. I've been told that 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 can cause problems with the eye. I don't stare at the sun, but I'm out in the sun, and so there there's no damage that can be done to the eye. Well, so part of it is when you say stare at the sun versus being out at the sun. Those are two very different things. So staring at the sun certainly can cause damage, and, and sure. that's that's not good for anybody. Being out in the sun, it's as likely or more likely to cause uh, problems in the skin around your eyes than it is to your actually to your eyes. Now, are you probably better off if you wear sunglasses? Yes, but my guess is is that you've had a few birthdays. You're in your 60s or 70s, and and once we hit ages like that, we've already had the majority of the sun exposure we'll ever have. And so although wearing sunglasses is some better than not wearing them, 
if you haven't been wearing sunglasses for 65, 70 years, then there may have already been some change that's occurred because of it. So again, I'm not saying don't wear sunglasses. I think you're always better off to wear them than not. But if for some reason you just really don't like them or don't want to wear them, maybe put a hat on. And if you have a hat with a brim on it, you know, that's kind of helping shade your eyes, that will do you quite a bit of, of good as well. So one other question he had uh, was, um, if there is any way to get a dilated eye exam without having blurry vision the rest of the day. Yeah, so what happens when your eyes are dilated is it makes the, the pupil, the little black spot in the center, it makes it much bigger. And as far as the blurriness, if you're already over age 60 or 65, the dilated exam should have very minimal effect on the blurriness or clarity of your vision. What it's going to have more of an effect on is your light sensitivity, because now a whole bunch of extra lights getting in your, into your eyes while your eyes are dilated. Generally, dilation lasts three to four hours. There are different drops that can be used. And so depending on the drop and its strength, it may have more or less of an action as far as the dilation. So sometimes we do have patients come in that tell us that, boy, I'm really bothered by having my eyes dilated or when my eyes are dilated, they stay that way for, you know, 12 hours. We have weaker drops that we can use that still accomplish virtually the same thing from our perspective, but not be as bothersome for you. So if you're someone that's overly bothered by your eyes being dilated, I would let your doctor know and ask them, well, do you have any drops that aren't maybe quite as strong that may not bother me quite as much? Great. So this is another write-in question from Latonia, and it's dry eyes are a big problem. I have tried all kinds of eye drops and a warm eye mask, I think, but nothing helps. Is there anything new out there to help with this? And yes, I am on electronics a lot. Okay, yeah. So the reason that being on electronics is pertinent is because when we're on electronics, we do this. We just sit and we stare. And as we stare, our eyes dry out. And so again, that happens more when we're staring at electronics, staring to drive, or even watching TV. Um, but as far as treating dryness, there's a number of different things. So usually, the first thing that we try will oftentimes be artificial teardrops, of which there are numerous kinds. And, and, and you know, there's a bunch of bottles of tears when you go to the grocery store or pharmacy. And what's important to know is they're not all the same. So if you've tried a specific one or two, let your doctor know what you've tried so that they might be able to recommend something that's actually different. The other thing you mentioned is a hot uh, compress or a heat mask. Sometimes that can be helpful, but there are certainly some patients that despite using tears or heat, that that doesn't do it. There's a number of different prescription eye drops that can be used to treat dryness. And when you ask if there's anything new, there's actually a prescription nose spray that helps with dryness. So there are a number of different treatments prescriptions that can potentially help you if you have dry eyes. So what I would tell you is important the next time you go to see your eye doctors, let them know that number one, you're suffering with dryness. Number two, to try to give them as clear of a picture as possible of what you've tried in the past so that they can try something new and different. Great. As it turns out, by the way, dry eyes is more common in people with diabetes than in those without. So it's just, you know, another one of the things to kind of be on the lookout for. And in some cases, you may have very dry eyes that they feel fine. So dry eyes can either create symptoms of dryness the way they feel, or sometimes it's fluctuations in vision that you notice that when I'm on electronics or doing other things, I start not seeing well after a while, then I have to blink, 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 and then it clears up. Usually that's from dryness. Great. Okay, we have a question coming in from Tracina from Memphis, Tennessee. Hi, my name, I'm calling, if people got diabetes and do not control their diabetes, can they go blind? Yeah, so it's an important question. Can people with diabetes that's uncontrolled go blind? 
And I'll give you the short answer, then I'll give you the longer answer. The short answer is yes, that can happen. Um, the longer answer though is it's a bit more complicated than that because there's some people with diabetes that's very well controlled that still develop eye problems. And there are some people with diabetes that's very difficult to manage that never develop eye problems. So just because someone has a difficult time controlling their blood glucose, it doesn't mean that they will lose vision or go blind. In most cases, blindness or any meaningful loss of vision um, is, is, I shouldn't necessarily say unnecessary, but really shouldn't happen. Because if the eye problems are found early enough and treated, most people do really, really well. So even with complications arising from diabetes, usually treatments can help to manage those complications and really prevent any meaningful vision loss. So one of the biggest diabetic eye diseases is retinopathy. Could you speak to how to prevent or help to prevent or reduce the risk, I guess I could say, um, of developing retinopathy um, and if there's treatments for it? Yeah. So, you know, the most important thing or two things really for preventing or preventing retinopathy from getting worse are doing the best you can with your blood glucose and the best you can with your blood pressure. Those are the two most important controllable risk factors. The other important risk factor is how long you've had diabetes and, and once you have it, you can't undo the clock there. So good systemic health, good systemic control is the most important thing. Then if someone does develop diabetic retinopathy, and the only way to know that is through an eye exam, because oftentimes someone can have diabetic retinopathy and have no symptoms that it has not caused any change to vision at all. So again, that's why it's important to have routine eye care. But at certain stages or once retinopathy gets worse or to a certain level, then we know it can benefit from treatment. So the treatment that we know as of now that it can benefit from are those injections that I mentioned earlier. Now, as it turns out, besides just trying to control blood pressure and blood glucose, there's actually certain Blood, blood pressure medications that are better than others when it comes to trying to prevent or prevent progression of retinopathy. So, you know, it's kind of interesting that really, you know, what can we do to, to better help our eyes or prevent eye problems? It pretty much all comes back to the same things that we do to try to help prevent kidney problems or heart problems or anything else. Just trying to do the best we can to take as good a care of ourselves as we can. But again, the most important point I think I can make, Carla, about diabetic retinopathy is that oftentimes there are no, most oftentimes, there are no symptoms and that we can't wait until there's a problem before we identify that something needs to be done. Yeah, I think that's a huge take home point is make sure to get your dilated eye exam so you can discover things early if anything is happening. Um, right. So I, th I think we have question. Most, yeah. I think most simply put, Carla, for that is good vision does not equal good eye health. And what I tell people is good vision means that you can see well today. Good eye health means that you'll continue to see well tomorrow. That's good. I like that. So we have um, someone who um, this is maybe off the diabetes eye disease, but I think still a really good question. Um, and it's a write-in. I get styes every now and then. They are bothersome. How can, can I take care of them myself or do I need to go see someone? Yeah, so pretty common. And, and actually that's not that far off when it comes to diabetes because people with diabetes are actually more likely to get styes. Um, so it's, it's, it's actually a fairly common thing. So generally what causes us to get styes is when we have little glands along our eyelids it become plugged up. It's kind of like getting pimples on our skin, but it's happening in our eyelids. And so we've mentioned a couple times already using heat or hot compress. So when we use heat, whether it's a hot washcloth or one of the beaded masks, or there's other things you can get, and we hold them over our eyelids, what they do is that'll help open up some of the oil pores. 
and let the oils flow out the way that they need to. So heat and a little bit of massage with it. And by massage, I mean just kind of gentle pressure. Can open up and then push through the oils coming out of those glands. And doing something like that can oftentimes be the best preventative medicine for a sty. If you do develop the beginnings of a sty, then using that heat more aggressively. So what I would tell you is five minutes or more of heat a couple times a day can usually help treat a sty without needing to go to see an eye doctor. But if it doesn't go away, it may be something else or may require something like an oral antibiotic and would be worth going to see your eye care professional about. One of the questions I hear quite a bit is, what is the difference between going to see an optometrist and seeing an ophthalmologist? How does someone make that decision? Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's one that can be very confusing. And so I'll, I guess I'll preface it by saying an, that I'm an optometrist, which means I'm a little bit jaded. Um, but what I would tell you <laughs> is that for the average person, whether you have diabetes or not, it really makes no difference whether you go to see an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. The biggest difference is if somebody requires surgery or injections into their eye, then that needs to be done by an ophthalmologist. But the majority of, of routine eye exams, the majority of eye exams for people with diabetes in this country are done by optometrists. So I think the, the bottom line is less about which one to go see but just making sure that you go to see somebody. So again, in general, it doesn't make a difference. If it does make a difference, then when you go to see that optometrist or ophthalmologist, they'll let you know. As it turns out, sometimes when people with diabetes need treatments for their eye, sometimes even if you're seeing ophthalmologists, they may refer you to a specialist, to a retina specialist. So that's an ophthalmologist that specializes in a very small subset of what they do. But again, in general, for routine eye care, um, seeing either an optometrist or an ophthalmologist is what you, should, what you can be doing. Great. This is, a, this is a great question. This is William from Kentucky. William, you're on the line. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, can an optometrist, is he qualified to pre-diagnose you as a, a pre-diabetic? That's my question. Yeah, so, you know, a, a diagnosis of pre-diabetes is based on blood testing. So whether it be an A1C or fasting blood glucose or an oral glucose tolerance test, diagnosis of pre-diabetes is based on a blood test. So that's generally not going to be something that either an optometrist or an ophthalmologist is going to do. Now, that being said, optometrists and ophthalmologists, uh, in most states, at least for optometrists and in all states for ophthalmologists, can order blood tests or sometimes do them in their office, but generally are not going to be the one that tells you whether you have prediabetes or not. Now, whether you have changes in your eyes that are related to diabetes, that can be done by either an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. Great. Um, this wraps up our last question for today. It's gone very, very quickly. Uh, could you give us three take home messages that you want listeners to remember specifically from today's event? Yeah, so I think a couple of takeaway messages. Number one is that good vision does not mean healthy eyes. Number two, uh, routine eye care especially in people living with diabetes is really crucial, in particular to find things earlier rather than later in order to take care of them. And three, virtually anything, not anything, but virtually anything, whether it's cataracts or diabetic retinopathy or macular degeneration, or as someone mentioned earlier, astigmatism, almost all of these things can be fairly well managed and that vision loss does not need to happen because of any of them. That with good care, maintaining good vision is a very realistic goal and outcome to have. That's great. 
A few items before we close for today. Consider staying online or on the phone to complete a short five-question survey. We want to hear from all of you and hope you will take a few minutes to provide us with your useful feedback. To help you feel confident about your ability to prevent and treat diabetes-related eye disease, we encourage you and your loved ones to talk to your healthcare provider about your risk. Schedule an annual dilated eye exam, whether you have any symptoms or not. And register for the next event at diabetes.org forward slash experts. All of these links are on our Ask the Experts registration page, diabetes.org forward slash experts. We're sorry we were unable to get to all of your questions during this live Q&A event. And if you have any questions about this event, you can always contact us at askada, that's A-S-K-A-D-A, at diabetes.org or by calling 1-800-342-2300. Special thanks to our expert, Dr. Jeffrey Gerson. I am Carla Cox, and on behalf of the ADA team, we want to thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to connecting with you at our next Ask the Experts events. March 22, my vision keeps getting worse, can it be saved? And May 24, what in the world is happening with eye disease? Please stay online for a short survey portion to close out our program. Best wishes for good health. And here are our survey questions. Thank you again for joining us. We appreciate your feedback on today's event. To provide your responses, press the corresponding number on the keypad of your phone. For participants online, please click on the poll section below the Ask a Question form and click to submit your response. So we'll ask them to put up the poll questions. So our first question, overall, how satisfied were you today at the event? What does an eye exam look like? Use a scale from one to five with one being not at all satisfied and five being very satisfied. I will ask that question again. Overall, how satisfied were you with today's event? What does an eye exam look like? Use a scale from one to five with one being not at all satisfied and five being very satisfied. Once again, one, not at all satisfied, three, neither satisfied or dissatisfied, five, very satisfied. While we take a moment for the next question to come up, I would like to let you know that if you missed a part of today's event or would just like to listen again, we have full recordings available by phone. Call the toll-free number 866-686-8240 to hear the latest recording. Okay, on to our next question. Before we go on to question two, remember that our next Ask the Experts event will be on March 22, My Vision Keeps Getting Worse, Can It Be Saved, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Our guest expert will give you tips for treating eye disease. To register, go to diabetes.org forward slash experts or call 1-800-342-2300. And here's question two. As a result of the event, to what extent do you feel confident that you can reduce your risk for diabetes-related eye disease? Press one for not confident, press two for somewhat confident, and press three for very confident. Once again, poll question number two. As a result of the event, to what extent do you feel confident that you can reduce your risk for diabetes-related eye disease? Press one for not confident, press two for somewhat confident, and press three for very confident. While we wait for question three to load, I'd like to let you know that you can find resources related to this event on our website, diabetes.org forward slash experts. Click on the February 22 event page under past recordings to find links to our eye health resources as well recording of this event. Okay, now let's go on to question number three. John is a 32-year-old man with type 2 diabetes. He has no eye symptoms. Does that mean he does not have to have a diabetic eye exam? Once again, 
John is a 32-year-old man with type 2 diabetes. He has no eye symptoms. Does that mean he does not have diabetic eye disease? Yes or no? So correction on that. Does that mean he does not have diabetic eye disease? Yes or no? While we await question number four, I'd like to mention that for additional information on managing our diabetes, you can enroll in an ADA-recognized diabetes self-management education program. This program will help you gain the knowledge, skills, and confidence to thrive with diabetes. You can find a link to a program near you on our website, diabetes.org forward slash experts, or you can ask a member of our call center at 1-800-DIABETES. That's 1-800-DIABETES. And now on to question four. Maria is 54 year old and was just diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. When should she have an eye exam? A or one within five years of diagnosis, two within three years from diagnosis, three within one to two years from diagnosis, and four at the time of diagnosis. Once again, Maria is a 50 year old woman who was just diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. When should she have an eye exam? Press 1 for within 5 years from diagnosis. Press 2 for within 3 years from diagnosis. Press 3 for with 1 to 2 years from diagnosis. And press 4 for at the time of diagnosis. For more information on eye health, visit eyehealth.diabetes.org. And now for our final question, number five. Rod is a 57-year-old man with type 2 diabetes. Which of the following will help reduce the risk and slow the progression of diabetic retinopathy? Press one for glucose management and control. Press two for a comprehensive dilated eye exam. Press three for choices one and two. And press four for vitamin D. And again, question number five, Rod is a 57-year-old man with type 2 diabetes. Which of the following will help reduce the risk and slow the progression of diabetic retinopathy? Press 1 for glucose management or control. Press 2 for a comprehensive dilated eye exam. Press 3 for choices 1 and 2. And press 4 for vitamin D. We offer many thanks to today's expert, Dr. Gershon, as well as our support vendors and visionary partners and the Focus on Diabetes Initiative. This concludes today's program in our Ask the Experts Q&A series. Stay well and join us for our next event. Thank you.